the regular broadcast of the Minneapolis Heritage Pre Preservation Commission will now begin. Good afternoon. Welcome to this live broadcast of a virtual meeting of the July 27th, 2021 regular meeting of the Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission. This meeting includes the remote participation of members as authorized under Minnesota statute section 13D.021 due to the declared local health pandemic. For the record, my name is Madeline Sundberg and I serve as chair of the Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission. I will now call this meeting to order and ask the clerk to call the roll so we may verify the presence of a quorum. Commissioner Bjornberg. Present. Commissioner Booty. Present. Commissioner Howard. Present. Commissioner Johnson. Present. Commissioner Nystrom. Present. Commissioner Sandbolt. Present. Commissioner Sadie. Here. Commissioner Struthers. Present. Commissioner Sundberg. Present. Commissioner Vanderike. Here. And members present. Thank you. Let the record reflect. We do have quorum. With that, we will proceed to our agenda, a copy of which was posted for public access to the city's legislative information management system, which is available at lims.minneapolismn.gov. Our first order of business is to adopt the agenda for this meeting. We will work from the agendas that are available online. I will go through the agenda and sort out what items will be continued to a future meeting, what items will be discussed, what items we put on the consent agenda to be approved as recommended by staff and without further discussion. So item number four is 750 Second Street, Ward 3, Certificate of Appropriateness. This item is recommended for consent unless someone wishes to speak in opposition to or modify the staff recommendations. Commissioners, is there anybody who wished to speak on item number four? I would also like to check with the public. We didn't have any pre-registered um, individuals, but if somebody has called in regarding item four, you could press star six and let me know that you are in the virtual room. Don't see anybody at this time. So item four will be on the consent agenda. And number five is 246 7th Avenue North Ward 3 Certificate of Appropriateness. That item will be discussed. And uh, item number six is Lynnhurst Residential Historic District Guidelines Ward 13. That item will be discussed. So again, the proposed agenda, um, the consent agenda will include item four, 750 2nd Street South. Um, again, is there any opposition to staff recommendations for this item? or any members of the public that wish to speak in opposition to this item. This consent item will be approved in one motion at the start of the meeting. And then item number five, which is 246 7th Avenue North and item number six, Lynnhurst Residential Historic District Guidelines, will have staff presentations, public comment, commission discussion and action. Um, commissioners may have a motion to approve the proposed agenda. Johnson so moves. So moves, Johnson. Uh, I'll give that to Commissioner Johnson. Is there a second? Bjornberg yeah, seconds. Yeah. Commissioner Bjornberg, any discussion? Uh, seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the motion. Commissioner Bjornberg. Aye. Commissioner Booty. Aye. Commissioner Howard. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Nystrom. Aye. Commissioner Sandbolt. Aye. Commissioner Stady. Aye. Commissioner Struthers. Aye. 
Commissioner Van Der Eyck. Aye. Chair Sundberg. Aye. That's 10 days and zero nays. Thank you. Uh, agenda is approved. Our next order of business would be to approve the minutes, um, which would be from our June, J July 13th, 2021 um, meeting. Uh, may I have a motion to approve those minutes? So moved, Struthers. Thank you, Commissioner Struthers. Is there a second? Booty seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Booty. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the motion. Commissioner Bjornberg. Aye. Commissioner Booty. Aye. Commissioner Howard. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Nystrom. Aye. Commissioner Sandbolt. Aye. Commissioner Stady. Aye. Commissioner Struthers. Aye. Commissioner Van Der Eyck. Aye. Commissioner Sundberg. Aye. Nays and zero nays. Thank you. The minutes are approved. Um, moving on before I open the hearing to public comments, let me summarize the process for conducting the public hearing in this virtual format. Um, the process is as follows. First, we'll act on the consent agenda that we just set. Once items on the consent agenda are approved, the commission is done with those items. Applicants may contact planning staff tomorrow about next steps. After the consent agenda items are approved, we'll take each remaining agenda item in order. First, planning staff will present its report and commissioners may ask questions of staff, then we'll hear from the applicant, and commissioners may ask questions of the applicant. After that, I will open the public hearing on the item. We will invite public comment. Um, we will take speakers in the order that they pre-registered, if there are any. Speakers will be limited to two minutes. We ask that after your name is called, you state your name and address for the record, and then proceed to your comments. After we've completed the list of any pre-registered speakers, we will see if there are any other speakers in the queue who have made called in. In order to activate your microphone, you'll need to press star six on your phone and then wait to hear the pre-recorded message before we can hear you. Um, so again, we'll take the pre-registered speakers in order and then open up to any other speakers on the call. Um, remember to state your name and address and please keep your comments to the specific application that is before us today. After the public comments are complete, I will close the hearing. Commissioners will deliberate and act on the application before us. So I will now open the public hearing on the consent agenda items. Again, this is item number 4, 750 2nd Street South. Um, is there any opposition to staff recommendations on these items? Please press star six if you have called in about item number four. Seeing none, I will close the public hearing on the consent agenda items. Uh, commissioners, may I have a motion to approve staff findings and recommendations for these items? Sandbolt, so moved. Thank you, Commissioner Sandbolt. Is there a second? Howard seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Howard. Any discussion? Seeing none, I will ask the clerk to call the roll on the motion. Commissioner Bjornberg. Aye. Commissioner Booty. Aye. Commissioner Howard. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Nystrom. Aye. Commissioner Sandbolt. Aye. Commissioner Stady. Aye. Struthers. Aye. Commissioner Van Der Eyck. Aye. Commissioner Sundberg. Aye. That's 10 yeas and zero nays. Thank you. Item number four, 750 2nd Street South is approved as recommended by staff on the agenda. The applicant may contact planning staff tomorrow about next steps. 
Our first discussion item, number five, is 246 7th Avenue North, Ward 3, Certificate of Appropriateness. The staff report will be presented by John Smalley. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. My name is John Smalley, and I'm pleased to be before you this evening to present a Certificate of Appropriateness to construct a new 66-foot tall, five-story mixed-use building with a master sign plan at 246 7th Avenue North in the North Loop neighborhood. Next slide, please. The subject property is a surface parking lot on the northwest corner of 7th Avenue North and 3rd Street North, the intersection where the Minneapolis trucker strike became deadly on July 20th, 1934. At that time, police shot 67 protesters. This parcel is a non-contributing resource in the Minneapolis Warehouse Historic District, lying in the 20th century portion of the district. The Warehouse Historic District is historically significant as an early example of commercial growth as the city's warehousing and wholesaling district. The district expanded during the late 19th and early 20th centuries and helped transform Minneapolis into a major distribution and jobbing center for the Northwest. The district is also significant for its concentration of commercial buildings representative of every major architectural style from the late 19th to the early 20th centuries. Finally, finally, the district is significant for exemplifying the work of ma master craftsmen in its construction. On August 11th, 2020, the Heritage Preservation Commission conducted a very brief conceptual review of the proposed building, along with the proposed rehabilitations of two contributing resources in the warehouse district uh, just down the block, 608 3rd Street North and 306th Avenue North. In the very few minutes available before the meeting had to adjourn due to the primary election being held that night, commissioners expressed general support for the proposed mural, the massing of the brick and metal clad building segments, and the simulated divided light windows being proposed. Next slide, please. The applicant proposes to construct a new 66 foot tall, five story mixed use building. The majority of the first story will be used as commercial tenant space. The majority of the second through fifth stories will be a parking facility, highlighted in blue on the representative upper floor plan that you see inset on this slide. Parking will also constitute the basement level and 32 residential apartments will line the street or south and east sides of the building. The building will have mostly rectangular massing with one notched corner that you can see in the upper corner of this slide. It's a little difficult to see in the rendering itself, but it's over on the far right side of the building. The building will also possess a mostly flat roofed with shed roofed street side dwellings. The primary facades will overlook 3rd Street North to the south and 7th Avenue North to the east. The first story will be 20 feet tall and the upper stories will be 10 to 11 feet tall in reference to neighboring historic buildings. The fifth story will be slightly recessed from the fa facades and will have private patios for residents. Those are where the shed roofed portions of the building are proposed. The west portion of the south facade will be clad in tan brick that you can see in the foreground of this rendering with the remaining, remaining portion of the building in dark gray metal panels that you can see in the background here. The same metal panels will be used on the east facade. Since the publication of the staff report, staff has received two public comment letters regarding this proposal, and these letters were provided to you tonight by our committee clerk. The first letter comes from a neighbor concerned about traffic and noise impacts from uses regulated by the zoning code, but not regulated by the heritage preservation regulations. So I've shared these comments with Public Works and the project's land use planner. The second letter comes from the neighborhood group who supports the project with the following conditions. The neighborhood group requests the applicant explore all possi possible collaborative options with United Properties, uh, the neighbor next door, to add access to ground level commercial space in this building from the pedestrian railroad corridor. That's the private alley just to the north of this parcel. The neighborhood group requests the applicant include illuminated glass or storefront windows at the northwest corner of this building and maintain and further develop the present uh, presented concept of visual art activation of that north side of the building as well as the west side of the building with lightened murals and or street art extending to the full height of the building. 
In terms of certificate of appropriateness findings, as conditioned, the applicant meet, the application meets all such findings. My presentation will focus upon those conditions, all of which are most directly related to compliance with our local design guidelines. Those are the Minneapolis Warehouse Historic District Design Guidelines, which were adopted in 2010. In terms of vehicular entrances, the applicant's design places all ve vehicular entrances to the building on a commercial street. That's 3rd Street North, contrary to the Warehouse District Design Guidelines. You can see these vehicular entrances in the foreground of this photo here, sort of on the left side of the slide, or I'm sorry, this rendering. The Historic District Design Guidelines designate streets in the district as either commercial, mixed, or freight streets. The subject parcel is flanked by one commercial street, that's 3rd Street North that you see in this rendering, one and one freight street, that's 7th Avenue North, just around the corner, and two private property lines that do not include, do not face public alleys. Per the district design guidelines, pedestrian entrances should go on commercial streets and vehicular entrances to a property should occur through alleys. And if alleys are not available, those vehicular entrances should occur on freight streets. Again, private, not public alleys and pathways flank this property. So freight streets are the appropriate location for driveways but the applicant's design places all driveways on this commercial street that you see in this rendering, 3rd Street North, not the freight street that is 7th Avenue North, just around the corner. The four drive aisles that you see in front of you, two entrances and two exits, are proposed to be located together and create a 40 foot wide, 48 foot wide driveway that will pose some challenges for pedestrians trying to cross it safely. In their application, the applicant states that moving the driveways to the 7th Avenue North side of the building would require an additional 3,500 to 4,000 square feet inside the building for vertical circulation. But I would point out that residential and commercial spaces in this building occupy a distinct minority of floor area, which is essentially a parking facility with first floor, floor commercial uses and upper floor residential uses lying in the street, as you can see from the inset representative upper floor plan in this slide. Again, the parking areas are noted in blue and the building is proposed to be five stories that could be increased and still meet the design guidelines height maximum of 10 stories. So for these reasons, staff finds it very feasible to move the entrances, the vehicular entrances to the 7th Avenue North side of the building and would condition that be the case. Would also condition that those driveways be broken up into two segments with each separated from the other driveway by at least 22 feet to facilitate pedestrian friendliness on that street segment. Next slide, please. In terms of pedestrian entrances, contrary to these guidelines, the applicant proposes to install a first floor chamfered entrance at the southeast corner of the building, 11 feet from the property line at the intersection of one commercial street, 3rd Street North, and one freight street, 7th Avenue North. But the guidelines state that the building shall be built to the property line adjacent to the public right of way with zero setback allowing a maximum setback of five feet for recessed entryways, but it does prohibit chamfered corners. It says that corner entrances on the building will be considered only at the intersection of two commercial streets and chamfered corners shall be restricted to the first floor only. I would point out as well, the guidelines also state that primary building entrances should be located on commercial or mixed streets and secondary entrances located along freight streets. Since the primary entrance is located on a chamfered corner at the intersection of a freight and commercial street, staff would recommend the project, and since the chamfered entrance is corner is set back 11 feet, staff would recommend the project be conditioned to prohibit that chamfered corner entrance and require the revised entrance face 3rd Street North and be located no more than five feet from the property line. Next slide, please. In terms of the trash enclosure and the building setback, the applicant has placed an accessory structure that is a one-story metal clad trash enclosure on the 7th Avenue North facade. The building loses its, rec its rectangular shape and volume at this point. No upper story of the building extends over this trash enclosure's footprint. It creates sort of a notched effect in the otherwise rectangular footprint of the building. The street facing walls behind this enclosure utilize a different wall cladding, architectural precast concrete, and these walls possess no windows or other openings. This notched corner creates a 20 foot building setback. 
but the design guidelines state that accessory structures shall not be visible from the public right of way and shall not obscure the building's features. The guidelines go on to state that buildings shall have a singular rectangular shape and volume, that building facades or portions of facades that are stepped back along street facades are not permitted, and that only such facades, step back facades will be considered if the proposed massing for the overall building is demonstrated to be compatible with the design of surrounding historic buildings within the district. The proposed mass massing shall be superior in design to the required singular rectangular volume. For these reasons, staff recommends the project be conditioned to eliminate the trash enclosure and continue the building wall and fenestration pattern exhibited on the remainder of the facade all the way to the corner. Trash, trash services can be located inside the building and rolled to the street as is common in buildings with no alleys. And the added habitable floor area will help compensate for area that might be lost to the increased circulation area necessary to move vehicular entrances to this Freight Street, the 7th Avenue North side of the building. On the slide here, you can see um, inset and elevation or rendering, I should say, that gives you a rough idea of the notched effect and what the wall behind this trash enclosure will look like. The trash enclosure is depicted at the base of the building in sort of a dark uh, hatched um, label. And then you can see where this stands over at the corner of the building on 7th Avenue North in the uh, slide or the remainder of the slide right below this. Next slide, please. In terms of deck and penthouse setbacks, the warehouse district design guidelines state that rooftop equipment, decks, or penthouse structures that project above the roof line, including antennas or other service devices or equipment such as solar panels or wind turbines, shall be set back from the primary building facades by one structural bay on all sides of the building. The equipment, decks, or penthouses shall not be visible from the right of way adjacent to the primary facades. Rooftop penthouse style residential units with accompanying decks or patios are proposed to be as close as 9.5 feet and 3.5 feet respectively from the edge of this building's roof. The applicant has not provided a reason to position them so close to the roof edge and setting these features further back would only impact an off street parking area. It should be noted that there is no minimum off street vehicular parking requirement for this building and the buildings proposed five stories are well below the 10 story maximum stipulated by the warehouse district design guidelines. So for these reasons, staff recommends the project be conditioned to ensure the proposed rooftop residential units with decks are set back from the primary building or street side facades by at least one structural bay. Next slide, please. In terms of balconies, the applicant proposes two story recessed balconies that you can see in the rendering at the middle of your slide. The warehouse district design guidelines state that fully recessed balconies will be considered for primary and secondary facades of new construction if evidence is provided that the building wall maintains the feeling of a solid building wall. In staff's opinion, two story recessed balconies are not emblematic of historic development patterns in this district. On a five-story building, large multi-story openings like you see in the rendering really don't convey, convey the impression of solid walls. For this reason, staff recommends the project be conditioned to limit the proposed balconies to one story in height, replacing their upper story with habitable, habitable floor area that again might help compensate for area loss to the increased circulation area necessary to move vehicular entrances over to the 7th Avenue North or Freight Street side of the building. In terms of materials, as you can see on this materials board on your slide, eight distinct materials are proposed to clad the building's two street sides. Four types of metal siding noted on the elevations, metal trash enclosure walls, metal parking garage screens, and then architectural or precast concrete for the walls flanking the trash enclosure. Tan brick will clad the westernmost segment of the building, as you can see in this rendering. The warehouse district design guidelines state that building facades that face a public street shall have one principal material, excluding door and window openings, and may have up to one additional material for trim and details. They also state that having one principal facade material and color on primary street side facing facades and another material for secondary facades is appropriate. And they go on to state that one color is appropriate per building facade and one secondary color is appropriate for accents, trims, and details. 
the guidelines are a bit repetitive. And I think this emphasizes the importance here that really eight exterior materials is just too many. Staff has already recommended as a condition of approval that the trash enclosure and notched northeast building corner be eliminated, which would remove the trash enclosure metal and the architectural concrete from the building street sides. That's two uh, primary materials right there. To ensure one primary material and one accent material are used on these street side building walls, staff recommends the project also be conditioned to eliminate the vertical corrugated metal siding that's designated as MTL4 in the upper right hand corner of your screen. This metal is proposed to clad the top story of the building. Instead, staff would recommend the black metal panel siding MTL2 be substituted for these very small segments I'm sorry, for this upper story. This MTL2 is proposed for very small segments, segments of the brick clad portion of the facade already. Staff would also recommend the project be conditioned to ensure the black metal panel siding, MTL2, possesses the same finish as the aluminum storefront and window frames. We'd also recommend the project be conditioned to eliminate or cover all at grade galvanized steel plate, designated as MTL3 substituting that with adjacent wall cladding materials. We would also recommend the project be conditioned to eliminate the parking garage metal screening. Uh, should these conditions be applied, this will result in two primary wall cladding materials. The brick segment to the building really reads as a separate building due to a facade break and staff feels that's appropriate. And I would point out as well that um, a commissioner commented on that um, with approval at the August 11th, 2020 conceptual review. In terms of roof shape, the building has a predominantly flat roof, but the only portions of the roofs visible from the street are those on residential spaces along street sides, and there you can see some shed roofs visible in the proposed renderings. The warehouse district design guidelines state that buildings shall have flat roofs, and for this reason, staff recommends the slope of these exposed upper roofs be reduced to meet the building codes definition of a flat roof. Next slide please. In terms of signs, the applicant proposes a large number of signs for anticipated tenants, for building branding, and as murals. The Minneapolis HPC's design guidelines for on-premise signs and awnings provides guidance for signs on buildings in commercial, I'm sorry, in historic districts. The following guidelines are applicable to this proposal. In terms of number of signs, each principal building entrance that, entrance that faces a public street or each ground floor principal at use, whichever is less, is allowed two signs, though corner lots with principal entrances on each street are allowed two signs per street frontage. Only one of the signs should be illuminated. In terms of location, building signs should only be located on the primary facade of the building adjacent to the street and should be no higher than 14 feet, except as otherwise provided in specific guidelines for wall signs. Canopy signs and service area canopy signs are not permitted. In terms of these guidelines, staff would note that numerous simple metal canopies did exist throughout the historic district, though they were most often over loading docks and without soffit signage. A canopy sign is defined as a sign printed or in some fashion attached directly to a canopy. The proposed stainless steel channel letters fastened to the soffit of a steel and glass canopy won't be compatible with the character of this turn of the century industrial building. For these reasons, staff recommends the project be conditioned to require the non illuminated canopy signs be attached to and not be extend beyond the edges of the canopy facade. You know, I apologize. That is, um, those are some notes that did not make the final draft here. I apologize. Uh, please disregard that last recommended condition. In terms of wall signs, the guidelines state that wall signs should be located between the first and second floor and shouldn't be higher than 14 feet, except where the historic sign band is higher. Now, according to the signage design guidelines and determining whether to approve a certificate of appropriateness for a sign or awning proposal, the HPC will consider special situations including building condition, building orientation, historic precedents, and exceptional design proposals. Deviations to, deviations to the number of signs that the applicant is requesting and the height of signs being requested 
is guided by historic precedents and building orientation. During the period of significance, the Warehouse Historic District displayed more signs, larger signs, and higher signs that are permitted by the HPC sign guidelines, which were adopted in 2003. The applicant has provided ample historical photographs documenting these conditions. In terms of building orientation, this corner building will occupy a larger part of the block and will have two primary facades. While the number of retail tenant signs does seem excessive, given the open floor plan and limited number of first floor entrances, each tenant is limited to two signs, as permitted by the HPC's design guidelines for on-premise signs and awnings by right. If the number of primary entrances equals or exceeds the number of first floor tenants. Both signs assigned to tenants are proposed to be illuminated. However, whereas the HPC sign guidelines normally permit only one illuminated sign per tenant. So there is a bit of a deviation there. The height of proposed signs is often driven by their proposed vertical orientation for which sufficient historic precedent does exist, again, as demonstrated by the applicant in some of the historical photos they submitted. The parking lot sign deviations the applicant requests are reasonable given the proposed size and placement of driveways on site. Next slide, please. Two sign area deviations do appear excessive and unwarranted, however. What you're seeing here are the north and western sides of the building, the interior and rear sides of the building. Where 32 foot wall square, 32 foot square wall signs are normally permitted by the HPC sign guidelines, the applicant proposes signs that are hundreds of square feet in area. The applicant proposes large graphics to cover the interior and rear non-street sides of the building, which are devoid of entrances, and where neither identification nor advertising is appropriate for both the HPC sign guidelines and the city zoning code. Now the zoning administrator has deemed the proposed colorful graphics and the North Loop Minneapolis text to be a mural with a non-commercial sign message. So these are permitted by the HPC sign guidelines and staff would recommend approval of those portions of uh, what you see on the screen before you. On the other hand, the French Bulldog silhouette that wraps around the corner of the building is the property owner's logo and is thus a sign. For this reason, staff recommends the project be conditioned to deny the proposed painted 896 square foot and 480 square foot French Bulldog silhouette signs on the rear and sides of the building where uh, no entrances exist. Many of the sign standards listed above aren't specified in the master sign plan, which is common. Until specific tenants with specific signage needs occupy the building, some signage attributes will remain unknown. For this reason, staff also recommends a standard condition of approval be applied to the project, requiring signs follow all standards of the Minneapolis HPC's design guidelines for on-premise signs and awnings, unless otherwise specified by the adopted master sign plan. For these reasons, staff would recommend the Heritage Preservation Commission adopt staff findings for the application by Hess, Royce and Company for the property located at 246 7th Avenue North and the Minneapolis Warehouse Historic District, subject to the 14 conditions of approval listed in the staff report. I'm available for any questions that you may have, and I know the applicant team is here and wishes to make a presentation as well. Thank you, John. I do actually have a quick question for you. Um, the trash enclosure, and I might just be missing this. It's a lot of um, conditions. I'm not actually seeing the elimination of that trash enclosure in that corner cut out on our list of conditions. Can you check to see if it's on yours? Hey, Madam Chair, yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Um, I think I cut to the chase and just recommend it as condition three. Uh, that the chamfered, oh no. You are right. Um, can, can you come up with some language that we can add as a potential condition? 
Absolutely. Um, and uh, perhaps if the clerk wouldn't mind, um, I can go back to a portion of my presentation if the clerk wouldn't mind um, recording a recommended another recommended condition of approval. I do apologize. Understand it's a whole list. <laughs> Um, Dr. Sloan, oh, yes. Oh, sorry, I just wanted to reply. Yes, I will take down whatever um, amended commission uh, condition you suggest, and we'll put it in the. Um, we'll record it so everyone can see it. Thank you. If you wouldn't mind uh, recording condition recommended condition of approval number fifteen, uh, that the trash enclosure shall be eliminated, and the building wall and fenestration pattern evident on the 7th Avenue North side of the building shall be continued to the corner. And I think that should um, eliminate the notched enclosure as well. That is the intent of this condition or the notched uh, corner of the building. So once the trash enclosure is eliminated and the building wall and fenestration pattern are continued to the corner, that notch should go away. Thank you. That makes sense to me. Oh, are there any other questions for Dr. Smalley? Don't see any at this time. Thank you. Okay. Um, so with that, it does. I will open the public hearing for this item. Um, it does appear the applicant is here and would like to speak. I can see a whole list, maybe six or seven people from the applicant team. I don't know which of you want to go first. Um, I have Mark Heffron listed first on my list, but I realize the design team might have a preferred order. If you could press star six and just state your name and address so we know which design team member is starting the presentation. Yeah, thank you. Commissioners Mark Heffron here. Can you hear me first? And yes. Foremost? Great, great, great. Mark Heffron representing the applicants uh, Cedar Street 1020 West Lawrence Avenue, Chicago, Illinois 60640. Um, thank you again for for hearing our project here. We're genuinely, genuinely excited to be in front of you. Um, this is our second venture in the North Loop. We are also the developer of the Duffy Lofts under construction along the 500 block of Washington. And we look forward to opening up those 200 units here this spring. Um, this building, it's, it's very worth mentioning that this building is part of a, a much larger development plan. We're also redeveloping the two neighboring buildings across 7th Street that are connected by the existing Skyway. And we'll be in front of you in two weeks with the formal application of the adaptive reuse of, of those buildings um, in two weeks. Uh, it's the Falcon Newell buildings there. Uh, these, it, it, these three buildings really don't exist without one another. Two are physically connected to historical structures via historic Skyway, with one housing more people units and the other delivering more amenities. Uh, the project in front of you today obviously parks the historical buildings but also presents an opportunity to deliver some meaningful retail while also properly activating the 3rd and 7th Street with residential, um, not in a token way, in my opinion. Uh, and it's just been a year since we have had this project in front of you because we carefully navigated the full National Park Service uh, historic cash credit process for the historical structures and recently obtained our formal part two approval. Uh, so we're, we're happy with where we're at. We're very, very excited to kind of get this project, get this project kicked off. Uh, the development will bring another 350 units to the North Loop, along with 40,000 square feet of retail. Uh, this particular building will accommodate only about 20 of the 350 units and 18,000 square feet of the retail. Um, but you know, nonetheless, it's part of the bigger plan, and uh, you know, the, the parking is obviously required because the the historical structures uh, cannot feasibly park. Um, the building with with any you know uh, level of scale here. So thanks again. With that, I turn over the presentation to Mike Critch of BKB, and we also have our historical consultant Liz Gales on the line to help any, answer any questions as necessary. Thanks again for your consideration. 
Thank you. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you. This is Mike Critch uh, with BKB Group Architects. We are located in the North Loop, just a few blocks away from this development. Um, in addition to uh, Liz Gales from Hess Royce, we have a couple of other gentlemen as well on our team that are available as well, um, based on any questions that may come up. Tim Grimms with Cedar Street and Joe Brown with BKB Group as well. So again, um, Chair and Commissioners, thank you so much for having us here. Uh, as Mark stated, we're very excited about this project. Um, uh, we've been working on this for quite some time and want to just go through a, a brief presentation um, that we submitted here earlier today. Um, the, the first slide, um, and hopefully you can see these, this is just the intro slide uh, that you have already seen, but it just showcases um, within the district, the historic district itself, the location of this current uh, vacant parking lot you know, directly across the street from uh, the historic Hall Hardware building and close to the new old building, uh, each that are a part of the project. If you can go to slide two, please. Um, slide two uh, showcases the existing block with all buildings. Um, and outlined in orange in orange is the multiple building development. Um, the project in question is where the surface parking lot is at along Third uh, Third Street and Seventh Avenue, um, and it's and it's surrounded by uh, other historic uh, buildings. Uh, slide three, please. Slide three is a view and rendering. Uh, it's a bird's eye rendering view of the three block development with uh, the historic Newell building and Falk building in the foreground, and then the proposed building uh, that we're discussing tonight uh, to uh, upward from the Falk building as well, consuming that, that entire site. Uh, slide four, please. Uh, this next slide is a slide that showcases the existing conditions as well as what we have proposed and submitted. So along the left side of this slide is uh, three various shots that uh, showcase what is surrounding this surface parking lot from various angles. And then the upper right uh, image is what we had submitted. And um, this showcases the uh, intersection of third and seventh with the metal building in the foreground and the portion of the brick building uh, closer to the Sable project. Um, a couple of comments on this as well as the rendering below. Um, based on some of the conditions that uh, were presented by uh, um, the staff members, uh, John Smoley, uh, we've made some adjustments in terms of, for instance, the sloped roofs. So you will see that those uh, we have um, let those we have gone away from that and created a simpler roof profile in line with the uh, recommendations. And so I'll, I'll point those out in future slides. And then the design has evolved as well on the bottom rendering that's proposed, which shows the brick building in the foreground uh, where there's a bump up of brick that we no longer need. And so it actually simplifies the rectangular nature of the design even more. And we think cleans it up as well. And then um, we'll we'll go through other adjustments as well as we go on. So slide five, please. Slide five just shows the four uh, elevations of the project. Again, uh, we believe that these uh, meet the majority of the requirements of the guidelines, and we think it, we're again are very excited about it in that it's contemporary in nature and yeah we think it's very fitting and fits appropriately within the district. Um, the next slide, slide six. Um, this is a little bit messy. Um, I ran out, uh, out of time here but I the main thing I wanted to point out here is this listed the 14 items that were staff 
recommendations for the project. And I just wanted to highlight the items noted in green are items that we agree with and accept. And so we are okay with those recommendations. The items in yellow are the ones that we would like to present and have a discussion about and talk about a little bit more with the commissioners um, as we see some of these and interpret them a little differently or or want to showcase how we think the project is still uh, very fitting within the overall context of the, the district. Uh, to the right of this are some updated renderings of the, the two that we had previously shown. Um, again, you can see some simplification of the roof lines in the top level where we've eliminated any sloped surfaces. Um, so it cleans it up even more. Um, we still think it has the dynamic character of the exterior facade elevations and the, the two compatible materials, the metal and the brick. And then the lower rendering, uh, which we'll discuss in a little more detail, shows a modification um, to the entrance drive to go to one opening instead of two is the primary element here and it creates more uh, gridded openings as well. So uh, we think it simplifies this quite a bit. So we'll talk about that and it eliminates that bump out that we talked about at the top. If you can please go to slide seven. Slide seven, uh, the title of this, uh, it's regarding condition number one, uh, regarding the driveway entrance location. And um, what we wanna talk about is our proposed revision uh, to this con condition. Um, we, we did um, really review intently uh, some of the comments uh, from staff and we agree with in part to um, what those driveways were doing to the pedestrian realm. And so we'll talk about that. Um, in our previous COW meeting and the previous HPC meeting related to the driveway entrances, uh, related to the overall building architecture, uh, the, step, the stepped portion uh, near the uh, private alley to the north or upper right corner, um, we did not hear any items of concern related to those. Um, however, in reading the report, we I, I would like to address some of those items. Starting with um, the driveway, uh, the because we hadn't we hadn't heard any of these items previously, we've developed the uh, project design uh, quite substantially. Um, there are reasons why we're locating the driveway off of third. And um, we had studied this location uh, pretty intensely and we believe it is in the best interest of the function of the block to group uh, that, that dr private drive uh, together with the adjacent uh, Sable project and public garage uh, closer together at the mid block of the long side of the block. And, also locating it as far away from the main traffic arteries of Washington and 6th in order to create the safest pedestrian realm and leave the majority of the sidewalks free of the vehicular crossings. Although historically there is precedence um, in locating these on, for instance, the freight streets, uh, we think it is in the best interest for pedestrians and the safety of the pedestrians and how the uh, neighborhood currently functions to be taken into consideration. Um, furthermore, there are a couple of other restrictions. We do not have access to an alley. Uh, the the, the uh, parking area or former alleyway to the north is private, so we do not have access to that. And then the uh, western portion of the property is a private um, pedestrian alleyway. With that pedestrian alleyway, one of the things we did, so we had two sets of access ingress and egress points, we've eliminated one of those so that we only have one ingress and egress point to the entire uh, block. That'll serve for both the parking as well as the loading. And so we've consolidated that down to one. What that does is it creates a wider entrance point to that uh, public 10 foot wide 
pedestrian alley that connects from Third Street up to uh, the north uh, to some of the other alley, alley and private areas there. So we think that's a, a much better contribution to Third. Um, and then we only have a singular uh, driveway apron then rather than a double. And so um, what that does is then it leaves the entire rest of the block leading to the east or to the right of the sheet and then also uh, all the way up to the private alley as all pedestrian uh, realm space. And we think that having that contiguous access for the pedestrians and landscaping and entrances to the retail makes for a, a really good um, way to design this project. Um, it, there's, there's, no, oh no. Okay, hopefully, um, can you hear me? I, I lost track of, of uh, my headphones. Yep, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. I, um, so the, the other portion of this, um, so uh, having access on third is not um, uh, necessarily new um, to, to this particular street. Uh, the new old building that we are doing has a pair of historic loading docks located on third street. So there's historic precedence you know, on this particular street. So we have that. Um, the adjacent uh, project next door has two entrance access points, uh, one on either side of the block on third street as well. That project is landlocked. Um, and so, uh, but it, but they're reduced in scale like we're proposing to do so that it creates the best pedestrian atmosphere. And then uh, a couple of blocks to the east at uh, 6th Avenue is the nor newer North Loop office building that was completed a couple of years ago. That also has a vehicle uh, entranceway along 3rd as well. So it, it's not uh, new to our project. And we think by locating it here, um, that it creates the best pedestrian accommodations. Um, the other thing I wanted to address that did come up and oh, based on that as well, just in the upper left uh, corner again is that revised rendering. So, um, so we consolidated the entry into one opening rather than two. So we think that has a really positive impact to the uh, street facade facing third as well, that it has more uh, window openings and apertures from that standpoint as well. So we think that that is an improvement. Uh, one of the things that came up here that's not on the conditions um, is related to the discussion about uh, trash enclosure. And I just wanted to clarify for the record that uh, that is not a tr trash enclosure. Uh, rather, it is a an electrical uh, transformer uh, to supply power for the project. We're locating that for a couple of reasons. It, it, two, it's located directly adjacent to another set of transformers for the uh, building to the north. So we're grouping those together so that those are all consolidated into one location. We have power uh, that it um, access along 7th and so we thought this was the best location to to locate it is up on that private alley and next to the other transformers rather than somewhere along the block so that that is why we're locating the transformer there and the transformers needed and we do not have any uh access via alleys because those, those are both private so we have to access it off of 7th avenue uh secondly uh the xl uh, provides the power to these. Uh, they do not typically allow uh, transformers to have any um, enclosures up above because they need to access these vaults and pick them off from the top. And so they uh, typically do not uh, approve anything over the, the over the top of these vaults. And that's why we've notched this out. Again, um, locating it at the uh, northernmost portion, it allows for the remainder of the street wall to be intact, rectilinear, and um, 
and consolidated and congruent with each other so that it maintains the overall character of all the other buildings in the district. And that's why you see that that notch. And then we're also required by the city of Minneapolis to screen these uh, transformers. And so uh, we're using the ornamental metal is, as a way to screen this. And I'll talk about the ornamental metal in a little bit, but this is the location where it would need to be. And that's why we're needing to create the knot. So I would ask that we have that condition removed. Um, as we go to slide eight, um, this, this slide will address conditions number five and six. And we wanted to have a discussion regarding the interpretation of the, this element related to the top floor and the two-story openings. So one of the uh, conditions discusses the, the top floor and um, what we're showing in the upper right corner, and we have the newer elevations as well. Again, we've eliminated any sloped surfaces, so we've uh, simplified it to create a rectilinear mass up there. So it's um, uh, so it goes in line with the rest of the architecture of the building. Um, uh, secondly, that top floor, it, we've set it back in relation to the uh, gridded, uh, the gridded form of the elevations. We've set it beyond the first column grid of both street facades. And so we are set back uh, beyond that first column grid of, of the grid of the facade of each side of uh, both on third and seventh. And then lastly, like related to uh, railings, um, they, they will not be visible along seventh from the right of way as can be seen in this rendering. And then um, the, just the very top portion of, of the guardrails would be visible. However, we uh, purposely uh, color matched those railings to blend with the uh, color of the cladding of that top floor. And those railings also fall um, in front of the backdrop of that top level. So they are, uh, they really will go away and not be visible from this point uh, from the right of way. Um, and so that, that upper left rendering really illustrates that. Um, and then I think addressing the second item related to two-story openings, um, I think, you know, one thing that we think is really important here is that um, the design here, uh, although modern, it uh, creates the essence and character of the warehouse buildings in the district. And, and one of the uh, inherent natures of the historic buildings is that they're an expression of their form and function. Well, uh, like, like those historic buildings, the new construction as well adheres to its function and therefore expressing the innate character of the housing units at, at this two-story element. Um, and so uh, we provided these recessed balconies and that, and we do not need the space up above it. So it's expressing the function of the layout of the unit behind the facade. Um, additionally, um, the we think that even though we have the two-story opening, it still maintains the rectilinear uh, uh, expression of the facade and the gridded nature of the facade because of the parapet, the top the end of that uh, continues across that opening, maintaining the street wall facade. And so this is a unique, a little different expression, but it does exist within the neighborhood. There, there are some other uh, photos on this sheet of various projects that have um, more than two stories where we have recessed openings. And so that appears in numerous new construction projects or they're stacked one on top of another. Um, and then additionally, proportionally, um, there is also evidence, uh, for instance, in the uh, Duffy project on Washington Avenue in the steel warehouse building. It's the photo on the bottom in the middle. Um, there's a two story uh, tall opening proportion that that's evident in the district in historic buildings. And, and so this two story proportion is echoed in the new, new construction as well. So we'd like to be able to maintain um, the design as, as we're showing here. 
Um, next slide. Uh, condition number 10 uh, related to eliminating the parking garage metal screening. Um, we've done a lot of work on this item uh, related to how that's being used. We're, we're using it, it we're, we are looking at a metal. Um, it's in line with the metal cladding that we're using, but it will have perforations. The perforations echo the gridded nature of the openings and windows and fenestration of the overall facade. It's just at a different scale. Um, we have simplified the opening to one opening and we'd like to be able to work with uh, staff on just the um, how to finalize the detail, what this rendering shows in the upper left corner is uh, potentially bringing in some thicker mullions um, that break up that that metal into a smaller elements and we think that is actually more in line with the overall design of the uh, project character. Uh, the other uh, photographs on this are our project representations of historic buildings around the district and there's one that's non-historic um, and these have expressions at the ground level that are multi-story openings and different ways to create that fenestration. Um, one of them is the uh, historic Cass Gilbert uh, warehouse building that uses ornamental wrought iron um, that echoes the, the Gothic arches and is used ornamentally as well as functionally on the facade. And so um, that's one element. Um, there's a lot of discussion about the number of materials. I think in a lot of these you'll see uh, three, four, five, six different materials. The lower right building has terracotta, stone, brick, uh, metal, um, you know, uh, windows that are different materials. So there, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of innate, cool detailing and a lot of interest in each of the individual buildings that have a lot of variety in them. And so uh, we're, we're re restrained, we think, in our approach, and yet we're bringing in just enough to uh, uh, tie all, all the elements together. And then the last slide, uh, just to try to wrap up here, is uh, related to condition 11. Um, and uh, we just wanted to talk a little further about the murals and signs and um, uh, John Smoley was uh, great in just describing the, the district here. Um, it is quite varied and unique within the city of Minneapolis that um, has uh, the historic nature that's intact and is evident um, within this entire district and uh, different signs and artwork and murals all do show up in various forms on full wall facades like the Copham building, uh, the Prince mural as an example, multi-story uh, uh, tile murals um, at Target Field. Um, uh, you know, historically there were uh, a lot of the buildings, probably the majority actually inscripted their and painted their names of their projects and the type of wares that they sold or used on their buildings. And so um, in the spirit of that, um, we really saw an opportunity here for the um, for the uh, north and west sides of our building to animate these facades by bringing in local artists to uh, do public uh, um, murals and artwork. Um, and and create a sense of place since this will inhabit a corner of the public uh, open space that's to the north of this. And so the idea of being able to bring in the idea of the brand of North Loop Minneapolis into this was definitely an important piece. Um, the Bulldog, we think actually it's not in your face. We think it's appropriate. It's it, uh, actually it, uh, the idea of having a, an animal on this brings an emotional and human uh, element to it that we think is kind of fun. And so, um, and we think it just ties in and it will be a part of the interest of occupying this this uh, corner of the open space. So we'd like consideration of uh, on that as well to keep it. With that, um, thank you for your time. Um, 
we're again all there's uh, five of us here to be able to answer any questions um, we appreciate and are very excited about this project and and look forward to uh, moving on from this and progressing the design and and uh, having a great project in the north loop so thank you very much thank you for your comments um i was wondering in the revised version you have with the one opening to the garage how wide is that new opening we're proposing that that be uh, 30 feet wide um okay. and it's again for for safety reasons for um, vehicles and pedestrians alike to be able to see the uh, traffic coming and going from the street to the garage and vice versa um, but we'd have the one curb cut rather than multiple curb cuts okay and and it also works with the it works well with the uh, the grid of the facade as well and for the transformer location did you talk um with excel about doing an interior transformer because sometimes they're inside buildings um so we've had a lot of um recent conversations with them uh trying to do vaults which the um the city of minneapolis uh really uh frowns upon um uh, doing vaults inside it's it's space that's not necessary and we we just recently completed a another project where um it was a where we wanted to cover it and and um it was a real battle with excel to, okay. to want to do that so that's where the basis of my comments are coming from thank you um did anybody else from the design team have specific comments they wanted to make or are they only available for questions Um, I, I guess I would open it up either back to Mark if he wants any concluding comments um, or Liz Gales, if, Liz, if you had any uh, other items that may have been left out. Um, I, I would open it back up to either one of you two. Hi, Mark Heffern here again, uh, representing the applicants. Um, I, I don't think we have any further. Mike, thank you for being thorough. Uh, we're just on the line here, whether it be other design uh, members from Mike's team or Liz, our historical consultant, we're all just here to address any uh, questions or concerns. Okay, thank you. Um, commissioners, are there any questions? Commissioner Johnson. Um, quick question on that rendering you showed or the redesign of the um, garage. Um, I don't know if it was the entrance or the exit that's going to be emptying out onto the north side of the building now. How are cars going to be getting in and out of there? Are they going to be making a right like east down the private alley or um, how would they access that entrance? Can, uh, commissioners, can you hear me still? Yes. Okay, um, we only have one uh, entrance and exit location and it's on 3rd Street. So we don't have, we would eliminate any other access points. We, we're not allowed to uh, enter uh, the, the side on the north side is a private alley. So we don't have access to that. And then the side where the pedestrian alley is that's not our property either and so we don't have access to that so the only opening is in the new rendering through the brick facade and it's a single entrance uh and exit both for for vehicles going into the building and exiting just at that one location got it um got okay. the the drawing too quickly oh, oh i'm sorry it's and then the drawing, the drawing why i asked <laughs> Can you still hear me? So I'm 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 looking at the the drawing, and it just seems like the the north part of the wall is cut out. So it that's just uh, unfortunately a graphic um, mistake. That's just a solid wall. There is no entry exit to that private alley to the north. So there's only the one down onto Third Street. 
Thank you. Are there any other questions for the applicant? I don't see any. Um, okay. So I will move on um, to the rest of the public hearing. Um, anyone wishing to speak for or against the application? Um, again, we'll take the pre-registered speakers and then open up to any other speakers who may be in the queue. If you could please state your name and address for the record before making your comments and press star six on your phone to wait to hear a recorded message to activate your microphone so we can hear you. Um, I'm looking at the list of names here and it seems like most of them are on the design team, but I'm not entirely certain on a couple. Um, so if you're on the design team and I call your name, and you don't have a comment, just let me know. Um, Jeremiah Smith, I can't tell if you're on the design team or not. I'm on the team and I have no comment. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, let's see. You mentioned those people. Sorry, it's just this long list here. Um, and now I'm looking, thinking maybe they're all on the applicant team here. Because uh, I've totally lost track of who we heard from. Um, Doug Mork, are you also on the design team, the applicant team. This is Doug Mork and no, I am not on the design team uh, as far, far as I know. Okay, fantastic. If you could give me your public comments. Sure, sure. So again, my name is Doug Mork. Uh, I am the director of the Building Dignity and Respect Standards Council and also one of the pastors at Holy Trinity Lutheran in South Minneapolis. Um, and, and I just want to speak briefly to um, really sort of the other historic aspect of this site, if you will, the fact that this is um, the site of the clash between uh, the police and the Teamsters striking truckers in 1934. Um, I've been involved in worker justice work for all of my adult life, uh, 35 years or a bit more. And, uh, and, and for all those years coming from Minneapolis, uh, it has been uh, part, of, part of the story of, of kind of who we are, that, that clash and the, and the significant events at that time, particularly in light of the moment we find ourselves now and the significant events of the last year, some of which uh, I would really argue grow directly out of the fact that we've disregarded workers' rights and, and, and put ourselves in difficult um, circumstances with many workers being left behind. Um, we just are really, um, it, I think it's really important to Minneapolis to honor this site. We're hopeful that um, this developer and, and general contractor will work with the local building trades community and with the Teamsters, not only to be sure that this project is built with uh, just labor and that this is built as a union project on an important union site, um, but also that there's a way to really mark and honor the events of 1934 uh, in the building, in, in or on the building itself. Uh, so again, certainly um, support historic development, support um, good things happening in the North Loop, um, but also want us to be uh, really holding those considerations, making sure that this project is is built with justice and with union labor and that it honors those events of 1934. Thank you for your comments. Um, looking at the list, I think everybody else pre-registered was from the applicant team. If I have not called your name and you are waiting in the queue and you would like to speak, please press star six and state your name and address for the record so that I know that you're there. Okay, I don't see anybody else. Um, 
So with that, I will close the public hearing and start the commissioner um, discussion here. Um, I'm really excited to see this project moving forward. And, um, you know, it's, it's been a rough year, so we like to see de developments that are still happening. Um, in terms of the items that were brought up by the applicant um, of concern, um, I'm curious to get other commissioners' opinions. I think the revision to one opening that's only 30 feet instead of the two being 48 feet does address some of the concern with uh, walkability in the area. Um, I am still a little torn on the matter because I do think it would be nice for it to be exiting onto seventh instead of third. Um, and, you know, it doesn't really meet our guidelines. Um, the, oh, Commissioner Sandvolt, you have a question. Yes, if I can uh, ask of the applicant, um, has there been a theme or anything determined for the mural? And if so, uh, or if not, could we make a request that it be somehow in uh, honor or to recognize the historic events that happened on the site? Hi, again, Mark Heffron, uh, representing the applicant. Great question and absolutely. Uh, we have, you know, of all the planning that's happening, uh, we have gone no further than have early con conversations with juxtaposition, uh, a local North Minneapolis art group about partnering with us on the art. I'm sure they'd be happy to work with, with that theme. We have plenty of opportunity as it relates to wall space on, you know, on those two facades. So there should there should absolutely be a nod to those events. We are we are by all means game. Thank you. I, I agree with Commissioner Sandvold. It would be really nice to see the, the history of the site um, referenced in those murals. I think the community would appreciate that. Um, the other items that we discussed here with the transformer, I'm also curious how other commissioners feel about that. Because um, I think it changes my opinion a little knowing it's a transformer versus a trash enclosure because those do get a little tricky. Um, I'm wondering about potentially changing the condition because I, I don't like the or I don't feel like it meets the guidelines to have um, the sort of different aesthetic at that corner. It seems to really highlight the transformer location. Um, if there would be some way in the materials to keep it a little bit more consistent and less noticeable if we needed to keep that notch for the transformer. So I'm curious if other commissioners have thoughts on that. Um, hopefully, hopefully we've got commissioners who have thoughts on this application. Commissioner Howard. Since everyone's just chomping up the bit to, to chat, I'll try to get things started off. Um, I really appreciate all the work that the applicant has put into this design. I think uh, just in general, I think it's a really um, uh, smart design. I think it fits in fairly well with the district, just you know, in a general sense. But um, I do agree with most of the conditions that Dr. Smalley put together on this. Um, just because of the, the small deviations to, from the, the design guidelines. Um, I also appreciate the applicant's uh, willingness to accept some of the conditions. And I don't recall all of them. I should have written down which ones were all the ones that you, you chose to accept. Um, but, you know, changing the chamfered corner and things like that, I, I truly do appreciate the work that went into that. Um, I really feel like the, um, the uh, driveway should be on the freight street. Um, I, I, it's hard to, you know, I don't want to redesign the building, but I, I would think that putting the driveway on that would um, would work much better from a, a district point of view, but that isn't something that um, I would, you know, uh, stick my neck on the line for. It's not that my biggest concerns about this um, design. I appreciate that you did uh, reduce it in size. 
um, to try to improve that pedestrian experience down the alley or the in between the buildings. Um, I disagree with your analysis of the um, the penthouses. Uh, you, you mentioned that it's back a, a structural bay. It's not um, that that structural element that's on the top few floors of the building doesn't go all the way down to the floor down to the ground. Um, so I really feel like those penthouses need to be pushed back. Um, uh, the, the bulldog is cute, um, but it's a logo. It's a sign, um, and just changing out a bulldog and being able to do that entire huge mural, I think, is a, a pretty small ask. Um, I, I'm going back and forth on the balconies. <laughs> I I uh, I don't know that they. Um, really detract from the solidity of the wall. Um, but I can see where Dr. Smalley gets that impression from the renderings that we've been given. I don't think in, in um, reality, uh, uh, it'll um, really read that way from the street just because of the, the materials that are in use. Um, related to the transformer, yeah, it's problem that that not just problematic. So even though uh, somehow that didn't make it into our list of conditions, it is something that I wanted to bring up. Um, I don't know if it would help to use the dark material back behind that area. Would that help uh, make that notch a little less visible? I'm not sure. Anyway, I just thought I'd try to get the conversation started by throwing some ideas out there. Uh, and I'm hoping the rest of the commission has some thoughts as well. Thank you, Commissioner Howard. Um, are there any other commissioners who would like to speak on this item? I'm scrolling through my images here because I also wonder if using the the metal panel um, at that corner would would help. Commissioner Bjornberg. All right, so I'm just going to try to build off a few things that Commissioner Howard just mentioned. I think that, you know, I completely understand the difficulty of the transformer and trying to sort of um, work with and dictate that. So, I mean, I do think that sort of looking at the darker material behind that would be a good idea. I, I do feel like that cutout is problematic otherwise. Um, and I really, really agree with Dr. Smalley on the um, sort of two-story balconies. Um, to me, that does feel like that is disrupting that facade. So I, I would like them to be um, single story. Thank you, Commissioner I, I agree, I find the balconies to be disruptive. I, I don't know why, <laughs> but I do feel like they disrupt the, the flow of the plane. Um, any other commissioners wishing to speak? Commissioner Howard. W would those two-story balconies be less disruptive? And again, I don't want to design by committee, but if that in between those two floors, if that horizontal um, piece was actually connected, you would still have open air on the top floor and on the bottom. I don't know, Is do you think that would be enough to get rid of that disruption? Is it the fact that it's a two story? Yeah, I think that that would help. <laughs> Again, don't want to design my committee, but um, yeah, I think that just having that sort of continuation would, would be really helpful. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I, th I think that is the problem I was having with it too, that I want to see that sort of like plenum continue across. Um, Commissioner Sandbolt. Um, just kind of in response to a couple of things. Personally, I don't mind the two-story balconies. They don't, they don't really bother me. I, I feel like the facade is still kind of intact and, and it's kind of reminiscent of some of the other things that are going on in the district. And personally, those don't bother me. Um, I do agree about the transformer. I understand the difficulties of working with Excel and um, accommodating their needs and kind of balancing that. But I, I, I do like the idea of making it dark from the east exterior elevation, whether that's the metal panel 
or if that's you know painting it because as I as I understand it that's a painted surface um, so painting it the dark color I think would be acceptable in my book um, just to kind of reduce how how that notch appears from the corner um, other than that I, I pretty much agree with all of uh, uh, Dr. Smalley's uh, conditions that he's written out for us and I really do appreciate the applicant's effort to um, accommodate some of the requests. Um, I, I also I, I agree that the, the curb cut on third to me is not really a problem. I, I really appreciate that it's been reduced and I think that helps a lot. I, at the size that it was originally proposed I would have been dead set against it. Um, but just with kind of the congestion that's happening on the seventh street side and knowing that neighborhood very well I, I worked over there for a long time i i personally don't see a problem with having the curb cut on the third street side so um, those are kind of my two cents i'm trying desperately to put together <laughs> um, all of my thoughts into a motion um, hopefully to be back on that shortly Thank you, Commissioner Sandbolt. I'm doing the same sort of thing looking here at the conditions. Um, and so it seems like I'm getting a sense that the, the two conditions that are maybe open to, to question to debate here are condition number one and condition number 15. Those seem like the two that people have kind of a thoughts one way or the other on. I'm wondering if any of our, our silent commissioners at this point have have ideas on, on one or 15. Commissioner Johnson. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can speak to all of these, but I guess just kind of maybe maybe focusing on one and 15 at the moment. Um, I, to me, I, th I the, the driveway being on third doesn't bother me as much. I think I share um, Commissioner Sandbolt's opinion that the two bays did seem like a lot um, and reducing it to one, uh, I think um, kind of really cleans it up. And to me, it's not as much of a an eyesore anymore. So um, I, I don't really have an issue with that condition. Um, the other one, 15, is that's the, the one that we're adding about the the cutout or for the garage or not garage um, transformer or uh, garbage. Um, yeah, I the cutout doesn't bother me as much. I think it is that it's that, that stark contrast between the two materials that really uh, makes it stand out worse than anything else. So, you know, I would be curious if we could kind of phrase our um, certificate of appropriateness in a way that, you know, they can make that that standout color blend in more with the rest of the facade. Um, what are some of the other things we're discussing? Really, oh, the two-story balconies. Um, you know, I, I I think that the the applicant <clears throat> did a really good job um, cons making a lot of compromises and and you know taking um, our long list of conditions and incorporating them. Um, so I. I don't feel like the two story balconies are that big of a deal um, to me. I, I think I kind of like the break in them um, gives it a little more character. Um, so I am a little um, I'm more on the side of the applicant on on that one. So but I would be interested to see what some of the other commissioners have to say. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Commissioner Sandbolt looks like you're ready to make a motion. All right, we'll see if I can get this, <laughs> all the language we need. I'd like to make a motion to approve the um, the application with the conditions as listed by Dr. Smalley in the agenda with the following revisions. I'd like to revise condition number one to read, reduce the curb cut on 3rd Street North to a single curb cut and building opening to 30 feet. As, a, as proposed by the applicant. Edit condition number 15 to allow for the transformer yard, but that the exterior facing walls on the transformer yard shall be of a dark color to match the color of the primary east facade. 
I had proposed to remove condition number six, which is about the two story balconies. And I would also propose to remove condition 10 about the garage metal screening. And then I would like to add condition number 16 that the mural be of a theme that acknowledges or incorporates the historic events that happened on the site, on the site as approved by staff. Thank you, Commissioner Sandbolt. Um, I would like to st ask staff how they feel about number 16, if that's something they're actually allowed to do or not. Madam Chair, members of the commission. Um, thanks, that's a great question. Um, the Heritage Preservation Commission can certainly request whatever it would like. Um, the applicant has indicated a willingness to work with a local arts agency to come up um, with something. Um, you know, if the commission wants it to be oriented in a particular direction, you, you all can certainly request that. It's a mural, it's not signage. Um, and you're trying to, you know, regulate compatibility with the historic district. So if um, you want something that relates directly to the history of this particular intersection, um, I think that's certainly something that you all could request. Um, you know, art is about freedom of expression. Um, but this is a historic district and it is a, you know, proposed to be a massive mural, really two murals that wrap around the side of the building. So at some point I feel that Heritage Preservation Commission is very justified in making some requests regarding the content of, or the, the you know, the um, what goes on those two very large walls. Thank you, Dr. Smalley, just didn't want you to feel like you've been thrown under the bus later on trying to trying to work with that. Um, is there a second to Commissioner Sandbolt's motion? Howard a second. second. Thank you, Commissioner Howard. Um, I guess I am I'm I'm waffling in my head here on your revised uh, condition 15 and I'm curious if anybody else has any feelings. It, is it just enough that it's a dark color or does it need to be the metal number one panel to match? If they painted it dark, would that alleviate everybody's concerns at that transformer corner? I, I keep going back and forth because I think the dark would help recess it, but if it's all metal panel and then it's suddenly like black paint, is it going to look weird? Maybe nobody else is worried about it which is fine. Doesn't seem like anybody else is worried. Okay, I'll let it go. That's fine. Um, to the clerk, did you get all those revisions? Okay. Uh, Chair Sundberg. It's mostly, <laughs> I guess um, if it's, uh, thank you for asking, first of all. Um, what I'd like to do is just, um, I have just some, apparently my typing skills are not up to par today. So um, I'd like to just put, well, that's really big font. Um, if I could just um, put them in the, I have like broad outlines uh, in the chat and then see if I have the spirit. I'll obviously be able to review the tape um you get any nuance but um maybe it'll help spark um some ideas of questions anyone else might have okay thank you ah. i have posted as i read it <laughs> the text that i read so um hopefully that's Okay, with everyone. Wait, Commissioner Sample, would you mind reading it again out loud for the record? I, yes, I certainly would. Um, my motion would be to approve as listed in the agenda, the conditions um, listed by Dr. Smalley with the following revision. Revise condition number one to read, reduce the curb cut on 3rd Street North to a single curb cut and building opening to 30 foot 
as proposed by the applicant. Edit condition number 15 to allow for the transformer yard, but that exterior walls facing the transformer yard shall be a dark color to match the color of the primary east facade. Remove condition number six. Remove condition number 10 and add condition number 16 that the mural be of a theme that acknowledges or incorporates the historic events that happened on the site as approved by staff. Thank you, Commissioner Sample, for, for going through it again for us. Um, is there any further discussion from commissioners um, on this item? Okay, I guess then would the clerk please call a roll on the motion. Commissioner Bjornberg. Aye. Commissioner Booty. Aye. Commissioner Howard. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Nystrom. Aye. Commissioner Sandbolt. Aye. Commissioner Stady. Aye. Commissioner Struthers. I didn't hear a second. If there wasn't one, I'll second it. But if there was, I'll vote aye. <laughs> I think Commissioner Howard seconded. Um, uh, Commissioner Howard seconded, so I will I will take that as an aye. Thank you, Commissioner Struthers. Uh, Commissioner Van Der Eyck. Aye. And Chair Sundberg. Aye. Yes and zero nays. Thank you. That motion passes. And belatedly realizing we didn't do any findings. Staff, did you need any additional findings or did our discussion provide enough context for our decision to change some of the conditions? Uh, Madam Chair, members of the Commission, thank you for a thorough discussion and buried with me um, as in particular in regard to uh, number 15. I think that will be just fine. The design guidelines do um, you know, permit you to grant exceptions and there is certainly some interpretation that's required. So I think at the staff level we'll be just fine with this. Great, thank you. Um, okay, then we will move on to our next agenda item. Number six is the Lyndhurst Residential Historic District Guidelines, Ward 13. Staff report to be presented by Andrea Burke. Good evening, Madam Chair and Commissioners. My name is Andrea Burke. And I'm the supervisor for the Historic Preservation Team, CPED. I am presenting tonight the Historic Design Guidelines for the Lyndhurst Residential Historic District. Next slide. Last summer on July 31st, 2020, the Minneapolis City Council designated the Lyndhurst Residential Historic District in the Lyndhurst neighborhood of South Minneapolis. This district is bounded by 46th and 48th Street West on the north and south, DuPont Avenue South on the what east, and then both sides of Fremont Avenue South on the west. And the district contains 65 out of 66 contributing resources. Slide, the historic district is significant for its association with the pattern of development in the area east of Lake Harriet and for its representation of residential architectural styles of the early 20th century. Next slide, please. CPAD retained a historic preservation consultant, Tess Bryson Company, to write the historic design guidelines. And together with the consultant and in conjunction with Ward 13, CPAD held four community engagement meetings with the residents of the historic district. Two were held with a larger group of residents and then two were held with a small working group of residents. Um, Feedback was gathered regarding the features and the topics of concern, as well as general information about how the design guidelines operate in the historic district at the municipal level. So we had four larger group meetings with those that chose to attend and then had several smaller working group meetings, which I know um, several of, of you as commissioners participated in as well. So thank you. 
The proposed design guidelines identify the background of the district, the period of significance, they list out the contributing and non-contributing resources, as well as the application process and tips for review with city staff. Next slide, please. Uh, for those that attended the meetings, but as for letting the rest of the commissioners know, window treatments and windows were the greatest concern to residents of the historic district. And what came out of those engagement meetings and discussions with the consultants and staff, the greatest amount of flexibility was given in the design guidelines for windows for this particular district. And it's important to note that the guidelines do not govern use, which is done by the zoning code in Minneapolis. Um, but I wanted to make the point about the windows because that was a, a very heavily talked about topic. Um, and if you went over that part in the design guidelines, you'll see kind of the extent of flexibility that was given in this particular historic district. Next slide, please. There is a separate section on new construction and garages, as well as landscapes, which is limited to only fencing and retaining walls. And I hope you can still hear me because my, seems like my internet is about to power out, but maybe not. With that, this is a very brief presentation, but the State Historic Preservation Office commented on the design guidelines favorably in their letter dated June 29th, 2021, and also noted that the guidelines were well written by the consultant. As such, CPEP recommends that the Heritage Preservation Commission adopt staff findings and adopt the Lynnhurst Residential Historic District Design Guidelines. And forgive me, there's an error in the staff report. I also have City Council. Design guidelines do not go to the City Council. They are only finally adopted by the Heritage Preservation Commission. So let me make that perfectly clear. Um, and the recommended motion is to adopt the Lindhurst Residential Historic District Design Guidelines. This concludes the presentation. I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Um, and if you have questions for staff about you know, any of the engagement process that happened for this, any questions about the design guidelines, um, I didn't see any registered speakers for this particular item, but um, if there are any that called in, let's see if they are there when you open in the public queue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea. Are there any questions for staff? Commissioner Howard. Um, just one quick question. Um, I do have some suggestions for some changes um, or additions or fleshing a few things out. And I'm just curious what the process would be if we were to condition approval on um, on a few edits and uh, what what we need to do as part of our motion for that. Do you need very specific language or can we put, you know, some general suggestions and then give you the approval to, you know, finalize it based on our discussion? You know, that is a good question. I think we would probably, I might actually ask John Smalley if he's still on here since he has most recently taken some design guidelines through, but um, I think there's definitely room for edits and for suggestions. We may just need to continue to another meeting, but let me pause for a sec and see if John is the one who can answer that question, what you've done in the past. Uh, yeah, Madam Chair, members of the Commission, um, in the past you have simply made motions with, you know, guideline language, you know, stricken out, amended or added in the same way you would with conditions of approval. Okay. And we have added those to the guidelines themselves. There is no, you know, requirement that the guidelines then go back to the state. Yeah, for another you know 60 day review, um, the guidelines are simply amended by you all and we move forward with them. It provided you adopt them. OK, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions for staff? OK, don't see any. 
Uh, so I will now open the public hearing on this item. Nobody has pre-registered, but I would like to check if there is anybody here who would like to speak for or against this item. If you could press star six on your phone, wait to hear the pre-recorded message to activate your microphone and let me know that you are here. Okay, doesn't seem like there's anybody here. Um, so I will close the public hearing and open this up to commissioner discussion. Um, commissioner Howard, I'm presuming if you have possible edits that this is something you want to comment on. Yeah, there's there's a few things. Um, I don't know if I should type in the Howard to comment again or. Um, <laughs> Anyway, we've had a lot of conversations about design guidelines over the last how many years have I been on the commission now? Um, uh, I, I'm just concerned that some of the, the things that we end up talking about again and again and again aren't really showing up in this. I do, I do appreciate the effort that went into this. I know that there was a lot of neighborhood engagement um, and um, I'm glad to, to hear that that happened. I hope it was uh, effective for the neighborhood because this is a really special neighborhood and I think the guidelines do great service to continuing to, to preserve it. Um, one of the biggest things that um, I looked at, at as I was looking at this is I was thinking about ADUs and I know we do not, um, we can't regulate the use, but I keep on thinking about how might those garages or how might these buildings be um, modified to address either having accessory dwelling units or having, uh, you know, meeting the, the 2040 allowance for three uh, families and things like that. And so I was looking at the guidelines for new construction and, and new garages and um, let me find my new garages. So um, I'm wondering if there could be some additional guidance on the height and the form of garage alterations, additions, or to address possible teardowns and new construction of garages that, that might then have um, ADUs in them. But I'm looking at more just the height and the form of the garages, and I, I'm not sure that the guidelines as presented give us enough on that. Um, when it comes to um, additions, uh, there's talking, there's a little section on um, uh, additions being located on the rear facade um, and then on the side will be considered, um, but there's really not uh, a lot of um, guidance provided to, you know, that there might be a, uh, if there was a, an addition to the side of the, the facade, that it would be set back or that that addition would be uh, lower in scale or height than the, the main building. Um, other things I noticed uh, under the guidelines for new construction and new garages, there's a statement for height. New construction should be no taller than the average heights of the houses on the block. When I read that, I'm taking the lowest height on the block and the highest height on the block and it can only be no taller than the average. So I'm wondering if that should be no taller than the tallest house on the block. Um, and then it says new houses should be two to two and a half stories tall. We actually have a historic house that's one and a half story tall. So I'm curious as to, you know, should that really be one and a half to two and a half stories tall? I don't know. These were some of the things that I, I thought about. And of course, having just gone through the, the uh, the previous discussion where we talked about the number of materials, there's no discussion of the number of materials on new construction in this, um, just that a palette of materials are possible. Um, so those were some of my concerns, um, just thinking back to some of the conversations we've had about uh, design guidelines. And I don't know how other commissioners uh, felt when they were going through all of this. Thank you, Commissioner Howard. Um, I'm wishing I had just typed in everything you said so that I could comment on things individually. Um, I had also noticed the height of the houses and I 
wondering if it's more that it was trying to go with like typical instead of average, because I, I agree that averaging doesn't um, meet median. Is that the right, <laughs> the different ways of averaging? Um, those all seemed like pretty specific things. Um, sorry, I, I did not manage to write them all down. Um, are there other commissioner comments? I appreciated looking through these guidelines that they were a more simplified, I would say, uh, set of guidelines than, than some of our older ones, which get a little a little complicated and hard for both applicants and us to interpret. Um, so I guess I, I did appreciate that and I appreciated that they were clear on new construction, also including new garages, as that is something we often get questions about. Commissioner Sandbolt. Thank you, Chair Sundberg. Yeah, I I agree. I I wish I would have been typing as uh, as Commissioner Howard was speaking because I I also kind of noticed something with the height and wanted to make sure that we clarified that. Um, and also, I re I really do appreciate that there's a differentiation between kind of some of the guidelines for ex the existing structures and contributing structures. Um, from the new construction guidelines and also the, you know, for the non-contributing resources. So I really appreciate that. That's been a sticking point on some of the other districts. And um, I, I agree with everything that um, Commissioner Howard uh, put forward. So those were my only comments. Thank you, Commissioner Sandbolt. Are there other commissioners um, who have thoughts on these? guidelines. I know this is the first set of guidelines for a lot of the newer commissioners to see come through. Commissioner Howard, I'm wondering if it would be possible for you to bullet point. I'm, I'm typing away as okay. we speak, so if other commissioners want to fill in the blank while I'm typing with some chatter, that'd be great. Well, He's going to ask one thing. I know it seems very small, but in the acknowledgments, I was wondering if you could include my middle initial to distinguish me from um, the city councilman, Andrew Johnson. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. I think that's probably a good idea. Otherwise, we might have some confusion about that. When, when people, if any, I don't know, does anybody in the public ever look at the acknowledgements? You never know. Somebody could get confused. Um, that's actually interesting now that I'm looking at the list of acknowledgements here. Do we ever acknowledge people who, the um, members of the public who help participate? I'm not thinking like by name, but just like a blanket statement. And members of the public who participated in public engagement. I don't know, something. Uh, Andrea Burke. Thanks. I just wanted to comment on a few things, some of the questions and comments that Commissioner Howard had. Thank you. Um, and I'm trying to figure out the best way to move forward without putting Commissioner Howard on the spot to completely itemize everything. Um, I mean, there's a couple ways we can handle it. We can adopt with conditions as John Smolny had suggested, which is an option. We can continue it to another meeting to allow time for commissioners to take into consideration some of these comments and then maybe sort of hash out some of their thoughts on them and specific specifics as to what could be done. Um, I agree with John, we don't have to send it back to the State Historic Preservation Office. I say of my comments about the ADUs, those were talked about and considered and staff's general opinion on those is ADUs are in use and that they were generally covered under the new construction and garages section of this. Um, and ADUs are largely governed by the zoning code. Um, they fall into line with the design guidelines and so on and so forth, but in terms of largely what's allowed and so on, it, it falls under the zoning code. Um, I see your points about the additions and the 
setback, um, so on and so forth. Um, height average, I see that. I think those are changes that we can make. Um, but I think just, you know, think about something if you wanted to, you know, if you wanted to itemize everything tonight, that's fine. Um, and we can make that happen. We can make a motion and and take everything into account or if you want more time. Um, my only comment I will make is that I. My expiration date here is very coming up very quickly <laughs> and well, that shouldn't yeah. be anything that you guys we, we have other staff yeah. members and they can handle it and that's fine. I just wanted to. You know, but also give you guys. I don't want to put you guys under pressure on the spot to have to make spot changes. And you know, if you want time to think about it, that's that's an option. So I just want to I want to clarify. My concern isn't about the ADUs or the use on the ADUs. It's the alterations that could happen to garages where ADUs would be placed. So I'm concerned about um, either tear down of garages and new construction. Um, what that new garage form might take. We wouldn't want it to be, you know, overpowering the the existing house or if there's additions to garages. Um, I'm not sure if the the language in here um, there's if the if the additions language as presented also applies to the garages. I guess is the question. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah, because I'm not I'm not concerned about the use. I like I that's why I prefaced my comment that way. It's it's the modifications that could that could be placed on a garage. So what I have um, out of the things that I, I haven't written anything for that garage aspect, but so for um, page 13 where we talk about side additions, I think that there should be some sort of a setback from the primary facade and that the additions would be lower in height than the primary house. Um, and I, I can put this text in the chat box after I hear from some commissioners to see if they um, think it's appropriate. Uh, for page 14, where the new construction is discussed, new construction should be no taller than the tallest contributing house on the block. Uh, new houses should be one and a half to two and a half stories tall. Um, on page 15, where the materials were discussed, I, I'm. Con my concern there is that you could have, you know, six or seven different materials. I noticed that most of the houses just have one primary material and a second, but there are some that have like a brick base with a stucco above. So um, is there like a one or two primary materials um, type thing that could go in there? And I'm not sure what to do about the garages because I'm not sure if, if the additions language as written um, covers alterations to garages. Thank you, Commissioner Howard. Um, I I see your point about the ADUs um, because if it, I feel like most likely they'd be a teardown and then a new construction, but is that really an addition? Is it I guess because it, it does discuss infill as being an addition, but maybe it would be nice somewhere to specify that an accessory dwelling unit would be considered a new. Yeah, would it be a new house or a new garage? I'm not sure. Well, I I, I don't think we can talk about it in terms of the accessory dwelling unit. I think we would have to yeah. talk about it in terms it, of the the con, the contributing structure of the yeah. garage. Um, I guess, I'm, yeah, would it be a new garage or would it be a change to an existing garage? I haven't seen it, any just added on to existing. Yeah, I don't know. But I, I guess I could see it happen. If it added on to an existing, it would be an addition. Right. right. Well, assuming that additions apply to garages, which I'm not sure that it, it's, it clearly states that. So that's, that's yeah. where my questions came in. And I, I thought about the the one property that we saw that had the the large addition to the rear and um, yeah. yeah. So I guess I'm wondering. I'm going back and forth on with this item should be continued to the next meeting. Um, in the experiences I've had previously with guidelines, Andrea, you wouldn't know this since it was before you were here. Um, we we had we've had one or two. Um, and they came to us as discussion items and then we provided written comments and then they came back as a, a as a 
actual public hearing item, um, which I think is how we filtered out these sorts of comments um, before reaching this point. I don't know if it makes more sense to continue it, have some edits made, send it back out to the commission, or if that adds too much of a, especially with it being a consultant involved. Um, well, well, and I would trust staff to just take these comments, comments. And, and run with them. I mean, I okay, I, I trust <laughs> trust all of you. So, um, I, I just don't. If if the other commissioners don't have these concerns, then you know we don't need to to address it. But I would, if if other commissioners feel the same way I do, I think um, I would feel comfortable with having staff just make edits on their own um, okay. on these. I mean, there aren't huge things. Um, I just, with the garages, we would just need to um, make sure that either the additions language does apply to the garages um, or something like that. Okay. Uh, Andrea, you have some thoughts. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to your comment, uh, Chair, about the discussion. So technically this is a discussion item. We, it, the way we put it on is I wanted to make sure it was noticed so that everybody in Lindhurst did know that this was coming because okay. discussion items generally aren't noticed. And when something does get noticed, it just automatically goes on as a public hearing. But if, if you've noticed, this doesn't have a particular number and it, we get into some of the technicalities here. So in a way, it is a discussion item with the option to vote on it. Now, should you want to send, um, you know, continue, send back with comments and we can revote there, we can certainly do that. There is no timeline on this, although, you know, I I don't expect you guys, you know, to to dwindle on it. I think you have very you know, concrete comments at this point. Um, and to respond to your comment as well. Yeah, we wouldn't have the consultant work on their contract is closed out. So it would be staff that would be making the changes to it and, okay. and bringing it back. And I think that's legitimate. You know, we we want to make sure that, you know, these guidelines do address what we normally see. And there's kind of only so much we can do in the initial stages before you take a look at it, you know, even with the, the community engagement and also give, um, you know, I don't think the, the residents would be opposed to having another chance to, to comment or sign up to speak. I, I you know, I don't, I'm not going to say that I don't want to speak for them, um, but I think it's reasonable to continue ask for some changes and then we would probably just re-notice as another discussion, even though it comes out as a public hearing and I've um, talked a lot with the clerks about that. It's just anytime we send out a public notice, it's, it's it's classified as a public hearing, but in this case, it is a discussion. It, it doesn't fall under the same rules as some of the other public hearings, if that makes any sense. Andrea, would you feel comfortable with these sort of general comments, um, the ones that Commissioner Howard has given, and and as well as the 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 question of the accessory dwelling unit and how that addition, not addition, garage, not a garage situation happens, or do you feel like you would rather make edits and come back and show it again. Do, do you want to just run with it or do you feel like you would rather we reviewed it a second time? I'm always in the camp of reviewing to make sure we did what you wanted to because ultimately, you know, these will be coming to you for review again. Um, you know, I think it's up to you. We can also take it and run with it, but I I usually err on the side of greater transparency when it comes to stuff like this. Um, my my comment, it will probably be handed to somebody else on my team to make it only because of the timing involved. And like I said, don't let that that cloud. And I know some of the residents are are very eager to get something passed, but you know, we didn't receive any public comments and I don't know if that's because they didn't have them or if I don't think there was an error with the notice, but I, I can't be for certain. Um, I guess I don't have a preference, but my my usual default is to err on the Sarah the greater transparency to make sure that what was added was was to your satisfaction. But you know, we often make conditions that or conditions are made that are then later enacted at a, 
a future point in time so we can do both. But I'm curious to hear kind of what some of the other commissioners think too, if they are also on board with some of these or if they um, have to. Thank you, Andrea. Um, I guess I'm going to follow up on that. Are there other commissioners who have thoughts? Um, thank you, Commissioner Howard, for typing those all into the chat so everybody can see uh, your comments. Um, Commissioner Struthers. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Chair. I am recusing myself from the discussion and voting, but I can say that I live in the Lyndhurst district, which is why I'm going to abstain, and, but we got the notice, so I expect everyone else did, just to clarify that. Thank you, Commissioner Struthers, for a proof of notice. Um, are there other commissioners who'd like to speak on this item? Everybody's being really quiet today. I'll just pop in and say that I think that the additions are welcome. Um, Commissioner Howard's additions are welcome. So I would like to see those changes, especially um, some of the pieces about the materials. So that's all. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Bernberg. Um, I agree that the materials, the one or two primary materials, I think. I would think two primary materials personally, but Commissioner Sandbold. Yeah, I I agree with Howard's, as, as I mentioned before, I agree with Howard's uh, suggestions for clarification. Um, and I do agree, um, probably the two primary materials, um, you know, speaking about a brick base or, or, you know, kind of different materials, but two primary, I think would be adequate. Um, as far as kind of procedural, I think what might make sense here is um, if we would continue this to the next, but then request that staff revise the draft and 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 draft up either as you know proposed conditions or proposed edits, uh, some of the things that we've discussed tonight, um, or revise directly and send out as part of the package that we receive a revised draft of the. Um, of the requirements for the district um, so that we can kind of review them again. And then I would really recommend that all of our, our commissioners sharpen our pencils, get to it. And if there's things that we want to see changed above and beyond, um, that we kind of have more specific language about what we would like to see revised. Thank you, Commissioner Sandbolt. Um, I agree. I think it would be nice for this to come back. Um, Andrew, do you feel like uh, continuing it from one cycle to August 10th is long enough, or would you want it to go two cycles? I don't know what that date would be. I only know one meeting ahead. Two cycles would be to August, I believe, 24th um, to August 10th. And, you know, I would try to tackle as much as I could while I was here, um, you know, so that, yeah, that is an option as we can continue and I would just say at this point, yeah, decide on how many cycles and then that would, um, that's important to set that date in motion. You know, the other one that I was going to say before Commissioner Sandbold spoke was, you know, if the other commissioners were satisfied with some of, and I could, you know, we could read aloud some of the comments that Commissioner Howard had typed in the chat for the public record. If everybody was satisfied with those, I mean, the other kind of other straight beeline option was, you know, we adopt with these conditions, you know, it basically changes conditions on this motion and then we would staff would just incorporate those. Um, but then that would sort of be final in a way, like conditions of approval in a way uh, as, as John had suggested. So there's kind of, you know, two options and I think it's what what the majority of commissioners want to do. Thank you, Andrea. Um, I guess personally, I would lean towards a sort of a, a continue with revisions. I'll admit I, I saw some typos and I was going to just like ignore them. But if we're going to send comments, I would I could highlight some typos and send them to staff. Um, I was just going to overlook it in the name of, of speed. But 
um, you know, not, nothing wrong with, with perfecting. Um, Commissioner Howard. So I will make a motion to continue this. Um, I, I didn't quite understand from Andrea, is, is one cycle enough time for you to make changes and to get it back on the agenda? I'm going to come out and say no. Okay. Um, and probably I think That's it's safer fine. two cycles um, just to make okay. sure that because I would like to re notice for it again to the okay. Lenders president. So yep. that two cycles would be more helpful. Okay, so I will I will make a motion to continue this for two cycles and ask that staff make revisions based on um, uh, clarifications on the side additions, uh, clarifications on the height of new construction, um, clarification on the number of materials that are allowed, and clarification on um, whether the additions language applies to garage additions. Um, and also to provide uh, guidance for massing and height of, of new garages. So that's not dictating what the language necessarily says, but asking for clarifications on those items. Is that a sufficient motion? I think that's fine. Yeah, okay. I think that works um, to continue two cycles. I would just add to make that specific and I'm actually just gonna double check to make sure the exact meeting is correct. Yeah, I would just make the clarification or add the amendment two cycles to the August 24th HBC meeting. Okay, I'd like to make a motion to continue those two cycles to the August 24th HPC meeting. Thank and you, that, sure. Howard. Howard. And that staff make the revisions based on the discussion we've had today. Is there a second? If you are yes, a second. <laughs> Uh, I'll give that to Commissioner Bjornberg. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the motion. Commissioner Bjornberg. Aye. Moody. Aye. Sir Howard. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Nystrom. Aye. Commissioner Sandbolt. Aye. Commissioner Stady. Aye. Commissioner Struthers. Abstain. Yes, thank you. Commissioner Van Der Eyck. Aye. Aye. Nine yeas and one abstention. Thank you, that motion passes. Um, so we'll see this item back in two cycles. That concludes our public hearing items. Do commissioners or staff have any announcements or new commission business to discuss? Andrea. Hey, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, give a friendly reminder. I will may or may not be here for the next HPC meeting on August 10th. Um, in my absence, you will see Kimberly Holleen, who will be proctoring the meeting, although that particular one, she might be out. So we might actually have somebody else proctoring that meeting. If I am not here, fingers crossed, I hope to be here, but I just wanted to keep that, uh, let you know that, that she'll be taking over um, the staff uh, presence in that respect. Um, also as the manager of the land use design and preservation team. Um, I also wanted to uh, make a note that uh, our section and CPAD was officially awarded a CLG grant and this was for a resurvey of the Washburn Fair Oaks historic district since it's been I don't know, over 40 years since that's been looked at. Um, and this is sort of a pre-step to being able to eventually rewrite those design guidelines, but to establish contributing and non-contributing status. John Smoley is heading up that CLG grant. Um, we were just officially given word of our award and we'll be kicking that off in the next couple months. I wanted to mention that last night we held a meeting a public meeting uh, for the designation study for the fire station 24 which was 
um, nominated and adopt or approved for moving forward for a study, commenced a study, forgive me, it was on February 16th uh, with some of interested groups and the neighborhood group. Unfortunately, we had a very low turnout, but we did hire a consultant who uh, came and gave a presentation and we did have the council member from Ward 8 show up um, and have some questions as well as the property owner. Um, but in my absence, Rob Skolecki will be taking over that project um, as that occurs in the next over the next few months before um, our consultant wraps up that particular project. Um, and then I also just wanted to give an update that the National Trust Grant, which we were awarded a year ago, it's a long story. Um, we have sent out the RFP for that, so that has been distributed so we are awaiting to get bids on that particular project um, and if you don't recall but it is a series of community engagement meetings um, with residents uh, in anticipation of a larger Minneapolis African American historic context and I think I also as I usually do I didn't do it for fire station 24 we have a lot going on right now but um, if there are any commissioners who are interested in participating or sitting in once we kick this off and select a consultant and start having these meetings, which a lot are going to occur while I'm out, um, please let me know or let um, Rob know who will also be taking over this particular project in my absence. And we can include you on some of those invites if you would like to sit in and hear um, some of the the discussion that that is occurring on some of this as part of this grant. Um, and then also the final return to in person meetings. This is still up in the air. There's kind of a, what I've heard actually our clerk Rachel may be able to answer better, but I do know that it, this might be happening in September. I think it sort of depends on um, when the, the health emergency has lifted, I think right now it is goes until the end of September and that um, hybrid situations are being developed. Nothing is set in stone yet, um, but I wanted to give you a heads up as soon as I heard something so you could adequately plan um, your schedules. Um, right now, CPAD has a return to work around the first week of September, right after Labor Day. Um, and so a lot of staff members will be going back to the office, um, although it's still TBD as to how much is going to be in person and how much is going to be home. Um, but I think that's when it is possible that some of these meetings may be back to in person at City Hall, but there might be a hybrid setup. There might not be, but that is what I know at this point, and that's kind of what I can tell you to just start thinking about preparing and so on and so forth. And that is all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, I hope we see you at the next meeting. If if we don't, best wishes. Well, we'll keep you in our, our thoughts. Um, I are there any other other announcements? or business items? Doesn't seem like that. OK, so uh, with that, we've completed all items on the agenda for this meeting. I will again ask if there are any other matters to come before this meeting. There being no other business this meeting, if not and without objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. The next regular meeting of the HPC is August 10th, 2021. Thank you.